Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being so prompt and on time so early on this lovely Oxford morning. I'm Susanna Grego. I direct public engagement at the Skoll Foundation. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Future of Media kickoff breakfast. This one is focusing on the news that serves. So Bill, I see several of you in the room who were here last. Can you raise your hands if you were here at this very breakfast last year? That's terrific. I would say that's probably 50%. Wonderful. So building on the success of last year's Future of Media track at the Skoll World Forum, we've convened media experts from across the media supply chain. Many of them are up here on stage, but also among you all, to better understand today's global media landscape and its mounting challenges. But perhaps most importantly, what we want to surface in today's discussion and in ongoing conversations throughout this track is to explore the most promising solutions that can support a thriving media system. We started this conversation, Pat and I, um, in January 2017 to share knowledge, research, and ideas on the very big questions facing the news media with a large diverse group from across this media ecosystem. This year, in addition to this session, uh, focusing on local and community news, we're also going to be looking at the very real influence of social media platforms and the tensions between their responsibilities and the freedom of speech. In today's session, we'll hear from speakers from around the world and diverse media organizations about how we can ensure that high quality journalism reflects, reaches, and is held accountable to the communities it's meant to serve. We've designed this panel to surface the shifting local media landscape across the globe, the challenges that news organizations face, and the solutions that are emerging. This session will be co-moderated by Pat Mitchell, sitting off to the right. Many of you, I'm sure every person in this room actually knows who Pat is, so, but I'm still gonna give a bit of background on her. She's our Skoll Foundation board member and my tireless thought and action partner on Skoll's Future of Media track. During her years as a producer, and I don't know if all of you know this, and media executive, Pat initiated, produced, and hosted many award-winning programs. And as the first woman president and chief exec of PBS, Pat led the public broadcasting service through the digital transition of hundreds of public television stations. After her tenure there, she became the president and CEO of the Paley Center for Media, focusing on documenting media's role in society. Co-moderating with Pat is Rachel White, here on the left, one of our school media partners. Uh, Rachel is president of theguardian.org and executive vice president of philanthropic and strategic partnerships at Guardian News and Media. Before joining The Guardian, Rachel was executive vice president and interim president of the New America Foundation. And for those of you who don't know New America, they work across media, policy, government, the private sector, and philanthropy to address the next generation of challenges facing the US. So you could probably gather, and you probably gathered before I even started speaking, that we are in brilliant hands, and we're in for a very provocative discussion. While I still have the mic, a few kind of boring but important housekeeping notes. <clears throat> please silence your cell phones. It's hard to believe, but we still have to say that. Um, and, but also at the same time, you can silence them, but feel free to share the conversation using our hashtag, which is right here, SkollWF. And if you're struggling to find speaker handles, you can go to the at Skoll Foundation Twitter handle and you'll find a whole list of speaker handles. Let's see, what else do I have to tell you? During the Q&A, Please wait for the mic to reach you before speaking because as you can see, voices don't really carry. <laughs> we are filming and live streaming the session, so we want to be sure to hear you. After the session, please take a minute. You've got these little cards on your tables. Please complete a session survey. It will literally take you seconds and hand it to someone on your way out. Delegate-led discussions. Uh, they're in your program. They start at 1145. If you're attending one of these, we recommend that you pick up a lunch on your way in and take it in with you. And last but not least, we must vacate this room promptly at 9.30. So we'll try to pack it with some great discussion before then. And thank you so much. Over to you. Enjoy. Over to Good Pat. morning. And thank you, Susanna, for making the media conversation so critical and at the center of much of the thought leadership at the Skoll Foundation and at the Skoll World Forum. So 
The title of this panel is News That Serves. So where did you get your news that serves this morning? Just shout it out. CNN, New York Times app. New York Times app. What was the other over here? Twitter. Twitter. Newspaper. Oh. Newspaper. <laughs> Newspaper. You found one? Oh, good. Uh, others? <laughs> Ah, okay. Well, we all know that wherever we found it, it's becoming increasingly challenging to find a source of news that is both trustworthy and free of corporate or any other kinds of influences. The trust in media overall is declining in this country and around the, in the U.S. and around the world. At the same time that the resources are diminishing, ownership is consolidating, and all of the challenges that bring us to this room again this morning to talk about how do we preserve independent voices in media, how do we support and sustain and strengthen the organizations that are serving both global and local audiences, because certainly history has taught us one thing, that when a dictator takes over or an authoritarian government is elected, the first thing that goes is a free and independent media. So we want to ensure in today's conversation that we look at what those challenges are and how, in fact, as Susanna referenced, we can find solutions to sustaining news that serves all of us. When I think about news that serves, frankly, I'll share some personal uh, admiration for The Guardian. And I think it's appropriate that Rachel is co-moderating this conversation because few news organizations have gone through quite the challenges that The Guardian has in the last couple of years and come out on the other side, transforming a business model, looking at global partnerships. They have in many ways modeled some of the solutions that you'll hear from the rest of the panel as well. So over to you, Rachel, who is responsible for creating many of those global partnerships. A, a few. <laughs> it takes a very large news organization to save itself at the moment. But um, thank you, Pat. Thanks, um, everyone, for being here. I, I'm so thrilled about this panel. I, I do, I, I'll pick up a bit on what Pat's saying and say why I'm so excited that this group of people is standing in front of the room, at the front of the room, but it's true. I, I think all of media, The Guardian, certainly at, really quite in the thick of it, has struggled through the last couple of years as our you know, revenue models for advertising have, that were falling, crashed. Um, you know, we, the confluence of a news cycle that's relentless, um, you know, a lot of threat to independent press and independent media. And, you know, I, I think for most of us, for The Guardian, certainly, um, you know, we've spent a lot of the last couple of years just trying to figure out if we were going to be able to, if we would persist and what that would look like. And, um, and we've been, we've tried some new things. We think we're onto a model that may be replicable um, for others. We're committed to a free, um, no paywall news organization. We want to make sure that everyone can read our news. And what that means for us is that we'll continue to rely on advertising revenue to the extent that it exists, but we have very robust reader contributions now, memberships, um, and, and increasingly different kinds of partnerships like philanthropic partnerships that are funding core parts of our editorial agenda that don't lend themselves to commercial revenue models, but also which are the most important topics of the day, things that wouldn't get covered if we didn't have the specific resource to do that. This panel, and so now that The Guardian, I don't want to say that we're out of the woods, I think we're, we are still um, shaking and quivering and hoping that we're onto something that's sustainable, uh, but we're in a much better position now, and it's allowing us to lift up, continue to report the way we do, do, do news, hold power to account, but think about our place in a global news ecosystem, to think about our responsibility for local news organizations, for regional news, for um, making available the power of a big platform. And this panel, I think, is going to help us tease out some of those ideas. I don't think any of us have a very specific idea of exactly how it fits together and, and um, who does what and what's local and how you make sure you have enough reporters and how you re connect those reporters to cause. But um, if anyone's going to start to figure it out, it's this group of people up on the stage. So, I want to start with Edith from NPR because as we think about what sort of global and national news organizations can do to support local and regional news and what local and regional news and organizations that are funding reporters around the world and in smaller places and ensuring that people have the information they need, what do they need from bigger platforms? It's hard to think of any news organization that's 
doing a more effective and comprehensive job of it right now than NPR, which is both thoroughly national, but also so deeply connected into local markets because of the affiliate structure. So can you talk a bit about your two years <laughs> of sure. soul searching in the news industry? Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, NPR is sort of uniquely positioned in that, you know, NPR, as you think of it, is a national an international news organization, but we have the benefit of 264 member stations all across the country. And they're in really small communities to, to big cities, and some big cities actually have multiple uh, public radio stations. So uh, what we are beginning a process of doing is trying to knit together local, which member stations do, and what we do, which is national and international, and filling in the missing piece, which is regional. And as uh, we all like to say, public media doesn't have enough resources to squander them. And so we really need to avoid duplication. And so there are opportunities for stations uh, to come together in things, whether it's a breaking news story. Um, let's avoid the six-year-olds at the soccer game phenomenon, everybody rushing towards the ball. Um, much of a breaking news story is, is a commodity. So you only need one set of sound from the police press conference and one reporter at the scene and one reporter over there instead of two, three, four public radio journalists swarming to the same location. The same applies to investigative reporting. We're building this system of hubs where, again, there can be joint decision making, but one investigative editor, which virtually no public uh, media organizations can afford to hire their own, can be shared. You can work with one reporter in the morning, another in the late morning, one in the afternoon, one in the late afternoon, and no newsroom is shortchanged by that. And there need to be smarter ways to bring expertise. In public media, a lot of uh, morning or evening hosts have multiple hats, and they might be the education reporter, or they might be the veterans reporter. Connecting them so that a reporter who covers Fort Polk can talk to the reporter who covers NORAD in Wyoming, and suddenly to discover that mislabeling a missile that inadvertently went to Cuba wasn't just a local issue that happened in one particular place, but you know, putting those dots together. So we are sort of uniquely positioned to try and stitch this together. The time has come. The member stations have embraced this with tremendous enthusiasm. And it is part of a bigger, broader effort that we're trying to do to sort of redefine what membership means, as opposed to just pay NPR money, get some lovely nationally recognized programs, and then sort of have a transactional relationship to sell an individual story. Think like a network, act like a network, and be a network. What, what's the, um, do you find that you, that the appetite for local news through the affiliate stations has grown over, I mean, what are you seeing in terms of your audience in these local markets? And how, when you think of this sort of like the seamless thread that goes from, you know, a truly national network, how does, like, how is that feeding up and do you feel like it's actually creating, can you measure the way it's uh, contributing to national discourse and do you also see that there's more appetite among your local markets or how's that fitting together? Well, it, it's hard to know precisely. I mean, NPR's audience is the sum of the member station audiences, right? So we don't have a different audience. It's, it's the sum of all of them. The good news is that, uh, you know, after an election, typically the pattern has been that the audience drops off. For the first time ever, the audience actually went up and is now uh, leveled off. And that's true not just for broadcast, but for streaming, uh, for podcasts, for uh, online, social media, et cetera. So the audience seems to be responding to say that there's an appetite. What we are, obviously, is an aggregator of you know, local stories that have national relevance. But our audience and collective audiences wouldn't be so large if the audience wasn't finding something of value as well in their community, because you know, ultimately, they are consuming a member station uh, content which is local that has the blend. So it's hard to, to, to measure in a more parsed out way, but the signs are strong. That's great. <coughs> Thank you. It, it should be clear that through this panel, just looking at what organizations are represented here, that we're going to get a lot of models. None of them were saying this is the solution to all the challenges that news organizations are facing, but each of them offering a different perspective. Because one thing that happens with especially smart strategic organizations is when there are these challenges, 
people rush in with new innovative solutions and some of them are in this room and this is going to be an interactive conversation so we invite you to interact at any point. I want to look at one of the ways in which there has been a very vital and robust response to the challenges that big organizations have faced. Um, and I and ask you to speak about that, Laura, because into that void moved people who literally created their own media organizations, as you did with a nationally syndicated weekly news program called Grit TV. Uh, and I real, the mission statement probably says everything about how you are intending to fill the void of news that serves. Yeah, also the, uh weekly syndicated program that begins with the hashtag, well, with the, the tagline, um, it's the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. So, so it's really a place where we platform those who are shifting power and those who are making change where they live. And I, as part of that work, I'm in touch with a whole network of people that I think reflect uh, the reality that's out there that is very rarely seen. You know, we left here last year, all of, all of us, I think a little bit kind of frazzled, particularly in the news industry. Oh my God, how could the world's most profitable news organizations have been so wrong about so much with such grievous effect? Um, and I think we left saying, you know, what would we give for a nonpartisan, um, not all about profit, information system that reached its tentacles into every part of the country and fact-checked fake news, introduced people to each other. Um, what would we give for a low-cost, diverse, multi-platform media system that people actually felt part of and could engage with where they live and, and use to, to check their assumptions? And at the Laura Flanders Show, as you probably guessed, we, know we tend to believe that what we need is not a new app or a new algorithm, um, but a little more attention to what already exists. And so we went out and, and we did some, some studying, as we do, and we produced a, a report on um, community media all across the country. And we worked as a consultant on another report that came out of the South from uh, Project South called Out of Struggle, Strengthening and Expanding Movement Journalism in the U.S. South. And what we found is that really all across the country, um, there exists just beneath the radar of this, you know, enormous multi-billion dollar industry. There exist community media that are struggling, but doing an extraordinary job acting as our nation's, what should be and could be our nation's um, alarm system, early warning system. I'm talking about the 3,000 public access stations and community and education stations that were founded in the 1960s and 70s as the cable industry grew. I'm talking about community stations 600 to 800 of which don't meet the criteria of public radio stations, but operate at a very local level, the majority of them on a, a revenue stream or a budget actually, a budget, there is no revenue, a budget of under 100,000 a year. We're talking about stations where in small markets, the um, news director is earning something like $28,000 a year. Um, black radio stations, local newspapers uh, across the country. Uh, our friends in Project South discovered that they, they mapped 13 southeastern states and they found, if we're just talking about black ownership, I mean, there's no gap greater than the gap between the races when it comes to media control and ownership. You may see some reporters, um, but across the board, at the biggest institutions, it's worst. At the middle institutions, it's still a challenge. NPRs. Um, uh, on air sound is still 74% white, much better on the women. But demographically, we still have challenges in our independent and public media. Um, so Project South went and looked specifically for black-owned um, media and found just in the South, 91 black-owned radio stations, 25 black-owned public access stations, um, going on to radio, 20, uh, 28 alt-weeklies, 85 black-owned um, papers, low-power FM stations. There's a radio bilingue that, it, that broadcasts radio in, in two languages at least. Um, 13 stations just in the southeast. Uh, the story that I'm trying to tell is that media at the margins, as we think about it, exists today and could be a critical piece of this ecosystem. When we say media, it's a plural noun. It's an ecosystem, even though we're in a capitalist, proprietary thinking world. As Edith has just mentioned, our power lies in our networks, not our net worth. 
Um, and this has really always been true. In the U.S., we have always had this system. You know, from the Revolutionary War and Tom Paine and Paul Revere to journalists like Ida Tarbell blowing the whistle on Standard Oil or um, Ida B. Wells with her own outlet, the free press, the free speech it was called, um, reporting on lynching. The free speech was the free speech until it was burnt down by white supremacists. Um, from the black press that covered Dr. King and Rosa Parks before the white press had even heard those names, um, to outlets like Jet Magazine that put the butchered face of, of Emmett Till on the front of the paper and changed the world's idea of what was going on, to these low power stations which have doubled in number in the last, last t 10 years, six years really, um, that are broadcasting some of them in multiple languages to farm workers in the fields, uh, to the people that we've been writing about recently in Detroit who are filling a gap in the, in the broadband provision world by meshing personal internet systems so that people can share communications locally. These systems, systems exist, they just haven't been funded. I mean, when you think about a $63 billion industry, the average revenue for nonprofit media um, is between $100,000 and $250,000 a year. Average journalist salaries, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, $51,000 a year. These are the people writing about teachers who are struggling and striking because they're getting $45,000 as entry pay. $51,000. So I want us to suggest that we need new things. We also need to sustain the things we have and connect them in networks and learn from them because there are lots of lessons to be learned from them about how they survive and thrive. You can see everyone on the panel is very eager to get into this conversation because, Laura, you have put so much important information in front of us and raised a lot of provocative questions, and we, we're going to visit them all. I, I just feel like, all of a sudden, I need to bring you in here um, because you, you looked, uh, Laura was talking in large part about the U.S. and the situation there. You looked in, in your country and and saw many of the same challenges as mm. well as opportunities and created again mm. your own independent media voice. Tell us about that and how that has responded to the challenges to free media that serves. All right. um, thank you very much. Um, Olushion, I run Budget, uh, a civic organization in Nigeria. Um, the conversation started because um, when you look at proprietorship of media organizations in Nigeria, they are closely linked to the political class. And um, it's always very, very difficult to get some certain kind of news into the offline or what we call mainstream media platforms. And the conversation is that you also run an organization that holds power to account, um, essentially telling them that we have schools, we have hospitals, we have people living in very inhuman conditions, and we need to project those stories in a strong way. And uh, if not for the rise of online media, like um, investigative spaces like uh, Premium Times, the cable newspaper, um, Sarah Reporters, it was always difficult. Um, to talk to the mainstream media about these youth development uh, issues because somehow it looks like uh, you are trying to bring down government or you are trying to attack their proprietor. You know, either it was overt or covert. Um, but what we did was to look at uh, how do we, we build an app called Tracker, which is essentially trying to merge both worlds of online and offline. So we track public projects through this platform, um, trying to tell people that you have a need in your community. There is a big chance that the project is in the budget. You need to tell us your story, and when you tell us your story, we we'll find a way to project that to the world. Uh, first, we use our own social media, which is really unfiltered. Then we now have to collaborate with some news organizations in Nigeria, like online news organizations, uh, who are putting investigative pieces on their front pages, and, and like uh, the cable and, and Xara reporters. And these people are able to amplify and project the conversations further. Um, and it's really, really changing stuff, because you find situations where someone uh, takes public funds, um, buys an ambulance with it, and, and puts donated by, just trying to show to the community that it looks like his own personal donation. And you're trying to correct the all kind of mentality within the system. And the only way you can have a conversation on that is to talk to um, offline and, and new media. And interested, the mainstream media that were lethargic to things like this are beginning to catch up. Uh, because they find out that there's great story in the things we tell, um, that this is a really real Nigerian, this is a real story, these are real people. And 
the conversation that we're now taking forward is uh, we now have people we call media fellows. Uh, we we'll basically work within our own spaces and talk about our own issues, and they get published on diverse media organization platforms. So the, the thing about it is making the people the heart of the story. Um, that's the way we have always crafted it. Um, and, you know, get the people to tell their story, um, and maybe they tell you to use our own different organs to um, amplify them to the last level. Um, and do we make friends with everybody? No, essentially no. Because sometimes it looks like we're trying to shame people. Um, sometimes it looks like we're trying to make people look like, oh, we've done a little, but you didn't amplify the little good we've done. Uh, you're always talking about the bad things. But the reality of the matter is that um, the whole essence of civil society is to make the political class uncomfortable as much as we can. Uh, so we continuously and rigorously have to do that. And I think uh, the way the media is shaping now, are these, um, Nigeria, social media, new shoots of online media puts up of an interesting season. And they might be our best opportunity to hold political class to account. Thank you. I think what you just said w will fit together very well with what yeah. I hope Alvin will start to talk about right now. First, I just want to say, is there anything more exhilarating than something called an equality fund? I, I, being in charge of an equality fund feels like being in charge of like the future of the better part of the world. But um, So I, one of the things that I find interesting, and when we think about how you knit together local and regional and global and storytelling, is the relationship between storytelling and journalism and cause, and, and the way in which there's, there's a very complementary relationship and the way that uh, journalism can be, should be, an engine for cause, um, but it can also, it, but, but, it can, it, but it can play other roles that are complicated also. We think at The Guardian a lot about the power of our platform and offering that platform for causes. We, um, two weeks ago, we gave our site over in the U.S. to the, uh, the Parkland students, the, the, the editors of the local, of the newspaper at their school, and it gave them voice and it gave them a platform, and um, I'd be very interested to hear from Alvin, about how you think about equality and cause and how you accelerate that cause and the role that local news and storytelling and global platforms and national platforms can complement that. Sure. Um, again, thank you for inviting me to this uh, conversation, and I'm excited to really be in conversation with many of the panelists here. Um, to step back a little bit, um, when we think or when I think about the question of media and equality, you have to understand that media actually tells us our values. It allows us to understand who belongs and who's othered, right? That actually comes from the space of media. Um, how people understand their politics around gender, around race, around nationalism, comes from this very unique space uh, called media. Uh, and that's both exhilarating and can also be very daunting. Right? And so I'm always interested in actually the role that media takes in really shaping um, social and political ideas. You know, Laura, you mentioned Ida B. Wells, um, who is oftentimes lost in American history. But it actually is the story of a, a black woman who went around the South telling these uncomfortable stories about lynchings that, that actually builds upon the question that I think uh, Brian Stevenson's and so many others actually b talk about, this question of proximity, right? It actually makes the question of um, who belongs very intimate. And oftentimes, social justice um, organizations uh, are looking for bigger platforms to really accelerate not just their causes, but also how are we going to turn the tides of democracy to be more inclusive? Right. Um, I'm always interested in thinking about um, where you know our country will be going, how our values are actually being shaped. Um, the Me Too movement has been driven uh, exclusively by a very strong media value space. You know, it's a very intimate story that starts uh, with Toronto Burke, um, based in New York City, and it becomes this international wave of actually how we think about gender, equity, the workforce, right? And journalism plays a very important amplifying role. What I think is also interesting is that um, we know that media actually connects. You know, there's always a question of actually who is part of our uh, media ecology, right? Like who are, the, who are the audiences that we're trying to really cultivate? Um, 
the, the question that I think also kind of resonates with us in the equality team uh, that I'm a part of at the Open Society Foundations uh, really is looking at the role of media in actually cultivating civic society. So last year we did a big initiative around hate violence in the US, oftentimes underreported. But what we were trying to do was to really take a stand that this is not normal, right? So how do you really combat the notion of normality around issues of hate? And so we had to create a fund that was extremely exciting to receive many ideas. And some of those ideas were about the question of like, how will we report this uncomfortable identity that is now taking shape uh, in the US. And you know, I must admit, it's been um, exhilarating to be a part of that, but it's also a combination of both media, organizing, litigation. Those things are much more interactive than kind of seeing them as separate pieces. And I, and I think that's where it becomes even more exciting, that we are looking at a place of media that is also part of a larger systemic ecology. You know, when we kind of mention the issues of authoritarianism, its role in actually trying to suppress media voice, right? It's not just about the, the question of actually who's a part of it, but also those voices that people are trying to really suppress. And so that's why we're really interested in this question. That's great. There's so many questions around funding that we want to come back to, too, Alvin, because not only have you raised all the ways in which funders can really have a huge impact uh, in the media ecosystem, because they mu if you are involved in something called the Equality Fund, you are right in that space of media is where so much of it gets formed, our values. Uh, Kirk, do you mind if I bring you in on this, uh, given your work at, at, you at, at in California, looking at the ethics uh, question in terms of media writ large, just briefly uh, what the program, and because it seems a good follow-up to okay. uh, Alvin. This one? Good. Um, the Markle Center for Applied Ethics, which I run, has worked on how values do get expressed in journalism. Uh, uh, Sally Lehrman is here as a speaker. Uh, that uh, we work together, uh, but also through business activity, through medicine, and so on. And it, it seems to me the time is ripe uh, more than it has ever been to reflect on how values are expressed in leadership in each of these sectors of society. And of course, it's obvious in government and uh, presidential leadership in the United States, but it's, it's true in the small stories. And so uh, there's a wonderful new book coming out on heroes in business from a historical standpoint. Dan here has written uh, so many good things about contemporary heroes, but there's some historical work that's going to be coming out. I think we need to rediscover how values are expressed in the leadership and those stories uh, that you all tell. Uh, day in and day out, and the more you can focus on bringing those to the surface, the values that lie behind, I think uh, the better chance we're going to have to rediscover our values uh, that uh, perhaps have been weakened lately. I wanted to just put the Markle Center on everyone's radar, and I know Sally's speaking on a, another panel later. Uh, back to ours for just a moment, uh, Rachel. Well, so Jeannie, it would be great to hear from you. Say a bit about Internews, but also, I mean, I think one thing we haven't talked about yet is just how you get more reporters in the places that are not covered, where, where how you start to pull the stories up from the grassroots or from local municipalities. Sure, I guess there's a, a number I'd like everyone to focus on in the world today. That is 13%. Only 13% of the world's population has unfettered access to the full range of news and information they need to effectively participate in their lives, hold their governments accountable. And it's the 87% of the world that my organization focuses on, trying to make sure that we can build local media organizations in the countries where they really don't exist to serve the needs of their communities. Um, that 87%, uh, we have partners in 70 countries around the world right now, tens of thousands of partners. These are local media organizations. Uh, we are not, despite our news internews, we are not an, a media organization. We're about capacity building of local news outlets all over the world. And all the forces that, are, that we're struggling with in developed media ecosystems, such as the United States and the UK, are on steroids in these countries. I mean, the market decline is, these are pre-market news outlets and the market decline is killing them. 
a huge issue on censorship and, 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 and violence against journalists. It's been a decade of declines and, oh, a de sorry, did anyone hear anything I said? <laughs> yes, yes. A decade of decline in media freedom last year was the worst year for, media, uh, for, for journalists to be killed in, in, in many, many years. So you have these two huge problems and then you have the trust problem. And who can blame people? The trust problems in our countries are really tough. The trust problems in Burma are a lot worse. Fake news, hate speech is fueling genocide in Burma. In Ukraine, we, we, we have a problem with the fake news and infiltration of our, of our election. They're in an information war in eastern Ukraine. It is, it is on steroids what we're facing in this country. And so the, the market problems, the, 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 the security problems, and then there is the trust problem. But what's really great about this conversation is I, we firmly believe at Interviews, and I think many in this room believe that proximity is actually a solution. Local, relevant, actionable, things that affect me and my family, that's what really can help build trust day in and day out. So I'll just do one example of, of how this works in a country. Uh, Afghanistan, uh, where when we started working in Afghanistan in 2002, right after the fall of the Taliban at the time, uh, there was no media at all. And now, after years of investing and in getting the policies right, journalism schools, building a network of community-owned, community-run radio stations that serve all 34 provinces, and creating what we call the MPR of Afghanistan, an organization called Salam Watandar, which gets stitches together the regional news and local news uh, uh, in Afghanistan, news is the second most trusted institution in the country in Afghanistan. So it is possible, bringing that proximity, building those local voices, it's possible even for the 87%. So I just challenge all of us here as we think and grapple with the really tough things facing our media environments, is let's think about how those solutions apply to the 87% of the world. Thank you. And when we talk about solutions, we do get to the foundation of this ecosystem, which are the journalists who are putting their lives on the line day in and day out, increasingly so, and are doing the work. And Christy, that's your work at the Global Press Institute. Tell us about that. Yeah, thank you. So at Global Press, we have a, a new approach to news. So what we do is we find developing media markets throughout the world, and we go in and we train local people, local women in particular, to become principled practitioners of journalism. Then we employ 100% of our, our training graduates to work for our award-winning publication, Global Press Journal. And the reason why this is so important right now is because, as everyone has alluded to, with so many problems in the business model of journalism, one of the real consequences has been that international coverage of developing communities has become increasingly reductive. Stories of war, poverty, disaster, and disease are the primary narratives that international communities get from the developing world. And that's unacceptable for two reasons. One is because it isn't true, right? And journalism at its core is you know, to serve the truth and its citizens. So what we've done at Global Press is found a solution to that, which is by training and then employing local journalists who always produce news first in their local language because news must be accountable to the communities that it serves most closely. And then we also have an English language version of the news that is syndicated widely globally in English. And the reason why that's so important is one, we are really trying to transform the narrative from developing communities, but it's also important, the training to employment model is also deeply important because I think too often we lament the poor quality of journalism without really understanding, as Laura points out, that most journalism jobs are actually poor quality employment. So at Global Press, we are solving this challenge by one, providing local women with strong living wages, full-time salaries, health benefits, paid maternity leave, and a duty of care program that provides for the physical, emotional, digital, and legal security for every journalist in our network. So we are really hopeful that as Global Press grows, not only are we helping to build institutions of free press locally, but that we are also helping to serve our regional and global partners by providing this news free of charge for syndication to really help diversify the narratives of our world. Well, that's the best that's news so inspiring. <laughs> Where were you 35 years ago? That was the gift for you. Um, David, solutions journalism. I mean, this, this is certainly uh, one way to look at the whole ecosystem um, and, and, and provide 
a sustainability <laughs> factor in keeping uh, and, and employing and training new journalists. How, are, how is the public responding to good news these days? Uh, well, so, so I would like to characterize solutions journalism as not good news. Uh, good. So, I, uh, so we've worked, I, our, our network, the Solutions Journalism Network, <coughs> has worked with about 150 news organizations now around the country. And um, like, for example, we have about 40 mid to small news organizations in New Mexico, Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado. <coughs> and most of them use this model of solutions journalism to sharpen accountability. Because basically, if they're looking at um, mental health care in, in Montana, where there's a dozen news organizations looking at that, or how to uh, uh, protect a rural community's future, they're going to be looking at what's possible how should we set the bar? How do we serve our community? By letting people here know what's possible, what we should expect from local authorities or local institutions. And the way that they do that is by looking at other places that are doing things differently, and in some cases doing things demonstrably better. And so they bring those stories back to the community, and then they use them to sharpen accountability and make, and make sure that local people can't hide behind excuses of we can't do better, we don't have enough money, and so forth. So it's not so much good news as it's news that really does serve the interests of the local community in the sense that they um, make sure that people can't get off the hook, but they also focus these stories initially by asking the community what's most important to you. And, and this gets back to the question of trust and proximity because, I mean, what we have found over and over from all of these news partnerships is that people constantly say, essentially, I don't care what you know until I know that you care. Basically, show me that, show me that you really care about our community, that your reporting is helping us get the information we need to build a better community. That shows you really care and therefore we'll trust you. So trust is ultimately a function of relationship rather than purely, um, you know, it's, it's obviously accuracy is important, but that's not enough. So that's, that's one of the things we're seeing. And it is often a question of proximity too, isn't it? Rachel, didn't The Guardian though discover something interesting in the upside? about the way we've always heard people want bad news they'll you know all the news that bleeds stuff that we've heard so much about in the states but you actually found people respond to good news and solution journalism they do i, I wish my colleague mark rice oxley was here this morning he's sleeping um uh, <laughs> he's not on the desk this morning and so he's having a nap or something but um he'll be at lunch everyone who comes to the solutions journalism lunch we'll talk about it there but skull foundation is funding the guardian right now to put on a series called the upside which is a it's a far-ranging solutions series. It's not particular to environment or women and girls or any particular topic, but more just a series exploring solutions journalism. And our editor-in-chief, Kath Viner, um, not too long ago, published sort of a, a long read um, about the role of The Guardian in the, as we sort of come up on 200 years of this news organization, what's our responsibility, what, you know, what's, what's our obligation to our readers and to the world, and, and what place do we fit in? And one of the things that she identified is that news organizations like The Guardian have a responsibility to offer hope and ideas and not just to hold power to account and not only to you know, shine a light on wrongdoing, but to, offer, to start to offer some solutions. And so this, this grant has made possible a series that has exceeded all of our best expectations. I mean, we are now seven weeks into the series. We have over two million uniques um, on the series. Some of the pieces are commanding audience of 500,000. I mean, these are really unprecedented. But more than that, the response from the readers is so gratifying. I mean, it really is, I think for the editors who are working on it, who also are editing a, a grim series about the refugee crisis, it's so rewarding. You know, it's people respond to it. There's a lot of social media activity around it. We've signed over 3,000 people up for a newsletter who want to push feed on this. You know, it's, we're actually, in a very short period of time, we feel we've created a community and all the response is, D don't stop, keep this coming. We want, we want more ideas that solve problems. Speak on a microphone. <laughs> uh, you're on, you're on. Am I? Okay. Yeah. Um, it, this technique works all over the world too, and I know David, you're looking at expanding solutions internationally. We went into Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria. The news industry was wiped out, electricity's down. Everyone was getting their news from Miami. You set up an, a, a news site called Information is Aid, or, uh, and, and it has reached half the population at its peak, and is currently reaching a third of the population on a regular basis. It's just basic 
news you can use, information is aid, where, w what's working, who's rebuilding. And when you get that practical and get that solution out there, it really changes, it's hugely popular, really changes things and can have a huge impact. Yeah, it's, it's been great. I'm gonna call on Ben Hicks, my colleague from The Guardian who is here and not sleeping this morning. Um, Ben runs something called the Guardian Foundation, which, which we fund from the Guardian. It's, it's not to fund our own journalism. It's a capacity building program to support journalists in other parts of the world. But one of the things that Ben has been working on with editorial support at the Guardian is um, the Guardian's role in a larger sort of global news ecosystem and what responsibility we have in supporting, especially across Europe, but, but globally, news organizations that would benefit from our expertise and our platform form and and content that would be beneficial to our giant global audience. So Ben, do you want to just say a little bit about how we're thinking about it? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so uh, really, I love this conversation. It's really interesting to hear such um, such inspiring stories from the panel. Um, so we, we've been focused, um, we're, we're quite a small charity, but we've been focused on um, our experiences in Turkey with Turkish journalists and Syrian journalists there. Um, and really what the idea is, is to um, pull all of the talent and the expertise we have in The Guardian and see how we can support those, those, um, those journalists on the ground. And we've been doing this for a couple of years now um, and we're still learning a lot. Um, and Internews have been doing this stuff brilliantly for, for many years. Um, and <clears throat> I want to tell a, a quick story about, I, about culture um, because one of the things we did last year is that we brought together um, international correspondents for a meeting with Turkish, um, with Syrian journalists um, is in Istanbul and the idea was to sort of share ideas and to talk about um, solutions to how we can build the capacity of Syrian media because there's these wonderful small Syrian media organizations cropping up across Turkey and what we found was the the attitude of the correspondents the international correspondents from all the big um, media was slightly like how can we help you guys and <laughs> and what was you know and I thought that's the wrong attitude the, the attitude is, what can we learn from these um, local journalists who have the cultural understanding? Um, they have a, a perspective that we cannot have. And that's the culture that needs to change. Um, so I'd like to start with that. Um, and then the other thing I want to say is solidarity. Um, sometimes it's just about being there. It's not about whether you uh, have a training session or where you're trying to take people. It's about just standing next to people and saying we stand by you. So, um, and I'm and I'm sure you know everyone can relate to that. So I think solidarity is key. So this relationship between international media and local media, wherever it is in the world, um, the network, and we'll talk a bit more about that, is the, the the potential to build these networks is immense, and to do it properly, and for them to give us enable us to um, not only um, uh, share learning, but also to um, um, build capacity at the same time. So uh, I think, and proximity. The well done. <laughs> the the um, this idea that you know we sit in our ivory towers in London, in New York, and um, we don't necessarily know what's happening on the ground, and having those. People from the grassroots is so important. So sending journalists out to these places and for them to experience that is massively important. So thanks, Ben. Thank you. Uh, can, that yes, that, that that Ben brings up is the relationship between global media organizations and local journalists is deeply important. One of the most common questions I get asked is, uh, you know, so and so news organization has somebody going into Democratic Republic of Congo or rural Guatemala, and can one of my journalists be used as a fixer? Mm -hmm. And the answer to that is 100% no all of the time because I think we have to change the way that we perceive local journalists, right? And really understanding that diversity is access, right? And the social, historical, political, linguistic context that local journalists has is extraordinary. And I think that too often we overlook the fact that the world is full, chock full, in fact, of trained and talented reporters. We have to, I'm going to bring all of us in, but then I'll come in to you. Because uh, that's what you're doing. What's the relationship between budget and other news organizations? I, I think, um, like, like she said, you know, there are a lot of people uh, down to the grassroots uh, who can tell good stories. And it's always important to find them and then basically trying to give them their own voice. Uh, what we've done with the Media Fellowship is we find very young people 
uh, talented who've written and uh, syndicated pieces in global spaces uh, like Ayode, Jeroma, and they went direct to write very, very deep seated case. Uh, there was an issue of two guys. One was just a car washer, the other one was a barber in the US, and suddenly the government uh, deal with the former minister of petroleum, and uh, they, they were started commanding billions of dollars through very, very opaque oil deals, um, Kola Luko and Gideon Omokore. And the guy wrote a very, very definitive piece about this on, 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 on premium times, you know, and it was really, really deep. And I really explained the whole deals and how he fashioned out. So it's always good to also be able to give fresh voices opportunities and to be able to fully express themselves. Because the whole of times we always kept in this old trap of the established voices, where most of them are just busy with their lifestyles and only want a press release to just get by. Um, but with young people who are you able to be patient with and be able to give some level of direction. You can subject them to some level of mentorship, which is something that we have also done to from a veteran journalist and get them to also review their pieces and provide feedback. In between that space, it's also to be put emphasis on data. Um, there's a whole lot of times we just try to write long uh, anecdotes and we're not really checking through if it really, really is data driven. That's something we also put in the front page to say, uh, make sure there's uh, st uh, no credible data. It could be any data these days, but credible data that is backing more of the conversations that you are trying to put forward. And let it be things that touch the people and clearly really show that the, that it's not just abstract writing. It's some things that people can tangibly feel. Uh, and I think um, which vertically comes back to what we're talking about solutions journalism, which is um, when we say there's a school in the community that has not been built, and there's a money that has been voted for it, and we use the media to amplify it through the voices of the people. Uh, we don't, don't have to stop there. We need to take it all the way down to whoever's directly responsible. We need to constantly provide feedback. And, and we've exemplified this through a small campaign we run called Open Now. So for nine years, Nigeria's parliament budget was, was in secret. You know, everybody spent it like they, they wanted. And this is a lot of money, like close to you know, $300 million every year. Nobody <laughs> knows how this money goes. And we started this old campaign with media, offline media, everybody, till the last day on when the whole budget was uh, was open and the details were shown. And even though was, we're still not satisfied with it, but at least it's a small victory we can hold. So it's all of complex stuff put together. Lara? I just want to add that I think that we're at a critical moment. We're talking about journalism and the way that we get good stories, but we're also talking about institutions that are critical to our civil society and to democracy. And when I think about this, it's not just that the local proximal reporters are bringing us the best information, it's that those institutions invigorate a, cult, a conversation at the local level that does not happen when that local outlet disappears. So we have at, the, at this particular moment, the reason that this conversation is so critical is that I believe we have at most maybe five to six years life left for this weird little ecosystem that has cobbled itself together over the last 200 years, speaking at least in the United States. Institutions, I'm thinking of people like the, the Zipperts, uh, civil rights activists who were the first interracial couple to marry in the UK and Louisiana. When they were living in, in Greene County, Alabama, they realized that the local white-owned paper in an 87% black county was routinely ignoring the stories of the residents and the residents the residents' um, perspective on what was going on, even to the point of um, Jeff Sessions when he was state attorney general, now our U.S. attorney general. When he was state attorney general, he was suing activists who were helping people register to vote on trumped-up charges. And what the Zipperts did was organize to take over that local paper, to buy that paper, the Greene County Democrat, which has now been publishing for 30 years with no salary, one paid person, it was the go-to place for the information that we all needed on Jeff Sessions, right? It was a hometown paper. It was also the paper in Alabama that helped to keep people engaged in their political you know, system at a time when they had every reason to turn off. Mm -hmm. And when you saw how Alabama elected a Democrat, Doug Jones for the Senate for the first time last, last year, don't forget those local organizations that not only supported the movements that registered the voters and got deep people who'd served time in prison re-registered to vote, 
10,000 of them were voting for the first time in that last election. They were, helped to they, were help they were part of what helped to swing that election for Doug Jones, which affects the U.S. Senate, which affects the world. I'm just thinking we need to talk institutionally, not just about journalism, but about democracy. And we're at a point where monopoly versus localism and fragmentation are on a complete co collision course. And if you read the paper this morning, the Washington Post has an important research database report on the impact of the Sinclair um, Broadcast Group's yeah. ownership of 193 yeah. stations and its must-carry and must-read rules on its broadcasters, they don't only lose some of the audience, but they see a, de a, a decrease in engagement at local um, electoral activity, a decrease in voting, um, and uh, a decrease in local news coverage, 10% less news, local news coverage when Sinclair takes over within a matter of months. Yeah. So you're getting national pundits, national news, except when they force the local anchors to speak the punditry they want to speak or be fired because of their employment contracts. And if they, get, if they, lose, if they leave their jobs, they have to pay money back. And, and the last part of this, so we've got worker issues for the, for the people who are employed in these industries. And the last one is simply, Talk to epi epidemiologists, talk to scientists that follow disease and pandemics. Local news reporting is one of the ways they track how flu spreads or Zika or H1N1. The dearth of local news, those local news deserts, are a desert of information around our public health as well. So I'm just putting an exclamation point at this in this conversation. This is all great, there are great things happening, but there's also a huge disaster looming. I can see Anne Marie Slaughter is about to leave and she's had her hand up for a while and I want to make sure that Anne Marie can come into the conversation before she scoots off to her own panel. I, I have a panel that I'm on at 10, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving that. I do just, I, I want to, I'm going to shamelessly plug my own work. We've heard networks. Networks, 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 which I love. I've been studying networks since the early 1990s. It's really important to think about how we design these networks. Um, there is an entire body of network science out there about do you, how do you build networks for resilience, how do you build networks to accomplish tasks, how do you build networks for scale. And they're basic, you know, centralized hub networks, that's what most of us do. We think network and we think one center and we're connected to lots of people. That's actually less effective than, than say, a pod network where you get different groups who are then connected in the center. Or, for some of you, a resilience network, right, which is deeply distributed. So I just want to make a plug as we talk about networks and I completely believe uh, whoever you said, uh, Edie, I think it was you, it's the strength of your network um, that matters. Uh, that we think about how we design those networks. Yeah. And, and Anne Marie runs the New America Foundation, and they're Which Rachel there. Used to be with. <laughs> <laughs> but they're, you're doing a lot of that work, uh, designing the networks and looking at this issue which Laura has raised. So thank you for, for bringing that into the conversation, which is the, the consolidation of ownership and how in some ways this comes down to funding. Uh, making sure that organizations like you described in Alabama, in which we'd hear all in many other countries, very similar threats. So, Alvin, you were brave enough as the only funder on the panel to, <laughs> to, to be there. But where do you think the responsibility yeah. lies going forward here yeah. with funding organizations sure. who are, like Open Society in particular, devoted to <coughs> maintaining and strengthening open societies everywhere. So I'm either brave or foolish. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I think the reality is this. this is Most people way. who are interested in journalism aren't interested because they want to run an NGO, right? So that's also just a reality that I, and a real tension, right? Like most people want to be journalists. They didn't say, I want to raise money, therefore I'm going to open X, Y, Z. That's not what happened. <laughs> but it's the construction of actually the capitalistic structure that we live in that really requires folks to really do that type of work. You know, within the foundation world, I think that, you know, the level of resources that we have are, are not infinite, right? So we have to make strategic decisions. Networks oftentimes matter. I'm always curious to know, like, well, who's in the network, right? Um, I think for us, inside our foundation, our interest is, of course, around the issues of social justice and transformation of society that it really creates a more inclusive space for all of us. 
And I think one thing that we've learned uh, really comes from the space of even social cognition theory is that you know people hear facts, but it's also very hard to understand them, right? That people really hear from a place that's their heart, right? Uh, so I'm always curious about the space that journalists really take in that proximity of the heart. You know, we all know vegetables are good for you, right? But there's not an uptick in vegetable sales uh, in, in the U.S. or probably globally. So we have to really begin to kind of understand the container that we actually receive this information. And I also wonder about the NGOs that actually have a mixture of revenue sources. You know, I'm from a traditional foundation. I think subscription services have really been interesting for us to really figure out. I think the, the shared notion of actually collective journalist has also been something very key and prominent. Um, I also have noticed that you know, even outside of the, the US context, you know, we do have foundations uh, in New York that are also you know, city-oriented. Like, so where does city government really provide resources for said interest, you know, as opposed to looking at something as global as the Open Society Foundation? So I think we're at a place where really rethinking the revenue streams for these um, issues is really key. But I'd also say the hardest part is also the question of sustainability. How do you sustain this work, and also how do you grow this work? Because it's incredibly important, and so therefore you can actually see conglomerates sort of coming in and taking over the media um, ecosystem. We've had a large panel today. They've all got a lot to say. We've got a room with a lot to say. Thank you for the interventions. We've already had 10 minutes left, so quick questions. No, uh, Yes. Just raise your hand, we're gonna go very quick lightning round and we're gonna take three questions before going back to the panel. No comments allowed. Thank you. Uh, Christy and Olison, I'm interested because it seems like there's a little bit of a tension at the heart of your work. It is in a way sort of a critique of the way we've been collecting and disseminating journalism for a long time. But at the same time, your work relies on syndication from some of these major outlets not only um, for revenue, but also just to get the word out and to make your work valuable or else it gets stuck in those local contexts. So what have, what have those conversations been like? Do you find that these major outlets like The Guardian, for instance, are interested in syndicating your journalism? Do they see a value there? Either because, um, like I think Edith said, there's a, a value to sort of democratizing this work a little bit or decentralizing this work a little bit? Or do you find that when you come to the table to have these conversations, they're like, you know, screw you, you're ruining everything for us, or you're making us look bad. Um, and have you had successful conversations so, with syndicators? Who's your question to, Christy or Olison? Both, both Christy and Olison. Okay, quickly. Um, I, I mean, it's, a, it's a really important question. I think for Global Press, we had an additional uh, hurdle to hop over, which is that because we work primarily with women journalists, there's often an expectation that, oh, it must just be blogs, or isn't that cute? It's like charity. Uh, and it's taken us the 12 years of our existence to actually demonstrate that our reporters are producing international caliber, world-class journalism that has won more than 40 international awards and actually uh, not only deserves a place in mainstream outlets, but is actually sorely necessary. So as we grow, we're increasingly having those conversations and are really uh, excited about the new partnerships that are in our future. Alishan? Okay, so I think that the thing is, there's always this dichotomy between media and society. Society has this old lofty idea that media feels this is just business. And we've been in that conflict for a whole lot of time until now. We're one of the major stations who believe that uh, we need to pay or if there's a donor who is not probably bringing a whole lot of money into the room, we can't just do this kind of work. Um, and I think it's a real, real challenge. And most of the time, you just need to define the highlights, people who basically have the same ethical thinking you know, towards a better society like you. Because um, there are people like that who just also believe that you have great story and they have a development uh, uh, thinking in their minds. But some of the time, the brick wall is really being able to say that media is part of the civil society and we are all just born at the same point. But it could be great in theory, but in times and practice, it doesn't just come out that way. Other questions in there? Oh, Tom? Uh, two very quick questions. One is, we're talking about proximity. How does that relate to polarization? Um, because if you're going for a subscription model, maybe you're reaching people that already agree with you. Um, so maybe that will exacerbate the filter bubble echo chamber problem that we seem to face. The second question is, there's a lot of evidence now that journalism produces a, a lot of value, actually financial value to society. So to, to Laura's point about 
um, how do you make that argument about journalism being part of a democracy? Um, Jay Hamilton has said that for every dollar invested in investigative reporting in the US, you get 100 back. How do you capture that value and recycle that into the media system? Great question. Yeah. Go for it. Anyone, go for it. Somebody. Um, I would just say that if I was going to do a closing comment, you can count this as that's exactly the point. I mean, I don't know. To me, journalism right. and media is the ultimate social entrepreneur. It is a commercial, often commercial entity that has such dramatic social good and social impact. We have to think of it differently. We have to think of it that way. And we are on the brink of losing it at the local level. Again, that institutions all around the world need to survive so that we can get all of that social good. There are lots of conversations happening about breaking the model and breaking the industry and changing the grip of Facebook and Google on ad dollars. Those are really interesting. I wish, let's do another session in an hour on that conversation because there's a lot of very am amazing stuff, but that's exactly the point I think that we need to be focusing on. Pat, we have a couple, we, we have a question in the back, maybe two questions in the back. Pat, if I just can jump um, in for a second on the polarization <laughs> question. Um, I think one of the, many great stereotypes about public media in the United States is, oh, it's just a bunch of liberal li uh, listeners or, or consumers. Um, we have more than 30 million people who tune in and broadcast in a week. Uh, we're the leader in podcasts. We're the leader in streaming. Our audience is roughly a third, a third, a third. It is slightly more than a third self-identified uh, you know, liberals but it is a third who identify as independents and a third or just under a third who identify themselves as conservatives. Now those conservatives probably are a, a spectrum of, of what conservatism is in the United States at the moment. But you know the premise and the flagship program on NPR is called All Things Considered. Mm -hmm. And that is very much our mission, whether it's in that program or in all the coverage that we do. And so that a, ability and necessity to provide what I consider like the old-fashioned USDA, you know, thing to have a little protein and some carbohydrates and some vegetable and some dessert, that's very true to our mission. And that's one way to, you know, get around polarization is to provide a, a range of things that people find something that's interesting and that keeps them engaged and coming back and building brand trust that way. So. I would just say at the local level, there isn't the opportunity really to be that picky. The woman who runs the, the community network of radio stations that I was telling you about, the smallest stations, her station is in Ames, Iowa. And she says, you know, if we didn't talk to Trump voters, we wouldn't talk to anyone. You know, those are our people. And they bring lit local legislators on the air every week. They talk to everyone. That's who's there. If they didn't do that, they wouldn't have any listening audience. So I, I think you're right. If you've got a $28,000 a year news director, he's gonna, or she's going to be pretty vulnerable to a big donor. But in terms of the kinds of conversations that happen locally, it's a very different story from what you might think. And it's actually less polarized, I would say, at some levels than it is in, in the Washington and in sort of the bubble conversation that we have in, the, in New York. In fact, there's research proving the connection between voting patterns and local media, which mm -hmm. is being done now. Some hand was over there, right, Rachel? Yeah. Hi. Um, we've been sort of uh, obliquely referring to the reality that right now trust in the news media is at an all-time low in North America, I think in the, generally in the English-speaking world. Now, I've heard a couple of people talk about values at this session. I inferred, correct me if I'm wrong, but I inferred that you were talking about uh, news reflecting the values of society and the values of the people on whom they're reporting. But I think there's a general perception among a lot of the public, and I don't think it's incorrect perception, that it uh, just as much reflects the values of the individuals reporting the news rather than on what they're reporting. And so that tends to lend itself, again, to a perception that the news is untrustworthy because I could, you could take any story and you can get interview 10 experts and present a particular point of view, but you could just as easily find another 10 or 100 experts with a different point of view. So you could slant, you could tell the truth and still slant a story. So do you ever, as people in the media, do you ever sort of ask yourself, what have we done wrong? Like, what, is, what have we done that's contributed to, the, contributed to this lack of trust in the media and what can we do to fix it? Great question, everybody, very quickly. Well, let, me, let me jump in. I mean, it, we're very conscious of that at NPR, and so particularly, uh, you know, we've made a big effort in, in the reporters that we're hiring. You know, we brought in Sarah McCammon, who talks about, you know, she grew up in a, 
evangelical ha household and went to an evangelical college. She has a lot of credibility with that community, and she broke a story that the evangelical community is going to meet with President Trump in June in Washington. We have, you know, Asma Khalid, who grew up as a Muslim American in Indiana. We hired Leila Fadl, who is uh, just done this week, is doing a series with National Geographic and NPR looking at Muslims in America. So it is really important. We've brought in Aisha Rasko to be our fourth White House reporter. It is important that we bring in people who have contacts and perspectives that didn't just grow up, you know, going to school in New York and Washington and California and, you know, have credibility with that audience and ability to parse through things. So it is, it is an ongoing challenge and one that we can never let up on. But, you know, we need to, to make lots of progress, and that's the only way to get credibility with the audience. If we sound like America, reflect like America, and avoid falling into cliches and traps about, you know, what the third world is like or what the second world is like, um, if we don't have commonality, people won't continue to consume our product. They won't find any connection with it. Okay, we have one minute left. Lightning round. Caleb and Ben, you both had your hands up. You both get to say something. But only a question, no long statements. Right. Okay, very quick question. Uh, we've talked about trust, but I'm also just wondering about getting actual attention from audiences and how, do you, how are you thinking about reaching people in a very, very crowded and increasingly more crowded space where it's harder and harder to get people's eyeballs Bad. and mind share? Um, just a very quick response. The, the answer to that question is that the, the, the model of the international correspondent has to change. And they, they, the people who are, especially for um, reporting globally, those people have to be within that country who are representing um, uh, the news from that country, they have the perspective. Um, but my question is, what is the role of the uh, international media when it comes to sharing business models? So the Guardian, you know, we're grappling with this, we feel like we're getting somewhere now at this stage, but you know, how do we share those models with you know, local media and you know, getting the network right, how that looks is obviously very important, but that feels like a task that everyone needs to get together, and that's very difficult to get international media to collaborate, isn't it? You know, it's a very yeah. expensive market. So, how would you get people to share the knowledge and sort of support local media? Have a lunch. And you can have that conversation in the hallway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then regrettably, we're being we, kicked out. <laughs> regrettably, we are out of town, but out of time, we're out of town we too. Are out of town. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but, but that's the challenge, isn't it? Create a network of all of the great ideas and um, and solution-minded individuals in this room and in particular thanking this panel for their leadership and answering that question as well as so many others regarding media in our lives today. Thank you for the news it serves and being here today.